Son of a bitch. The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds The return to this version of Hyrule was not only a joy to play, but it also seems this game is on par with, or maybe even more broken than A Link to the Past, if you can believe that. Now the glitches, sequence breaks and skips in A Link Between Worlds are some of the most simple and satisfying to pull off. But before we get into that, here's Rockman. No, not that Rockman, uh this guy. Link can lift a rock and hold his sword and shield at the same time, causing this weirdness. Oh well, this is new. To do this, simply lift a rock and then press the R button immediately afterwards. It seems nobody at Nintendo considered the player might actually try to use the shield at the same time as picking up a rock. I mean, why would they? Well, because you can. Hey man, you mind spotting me while I work out? Ugh, that should do it. I don't want to get too big. Okay, let's move on to the first skip of the game, which allows us to reach Death Mountain early and skip the power gloves entirely in a speedrun. The setup for this trick is incredibly simple, and all that's required is you have to move Link to certain points in the area to have this crow attack Link in a very specific way. Sounds pretty simple, right? That's because it is. Firstly, have Link stop at this sign, then to this spot here, and then finally have Link stand at the corner of this ledge, and if you've done this correctly, the crow will always attack Link. It's here that we need to have Link jump from the ledge as the crow attacks, which knocks Link back as he takes damage, and boosts him onto the top of these rocks and gives him the access to the caves leading to Death Mountain. As long as you follow this exact path, the crow will always attack, and then it's simply timing to pull off the damage boost to get on the rocks. And then there's no need for the power gloves which you receive later in the game. When you reach Death Mountain, activate the weather vane to easily return here later once you meet Irene. However, doing this sequence break at the very beginning of the game will have some pretty hilarious effects on the rest of it, as well as some other differences from playing normally. By triggering the cutscene where Death Mountain erupts, Ravio's full shop opens at Link's house. If you die on Death Mountain after activating the weather vane, when you continue the game, you'll now be inside Ravio's shop, who you haven't met yet, though he already decided he'd move his stuff into your house. But this means you can now rent items from him before you're intended to, so this is essentially a glitch called rental items early. The fact that we can rent items before we've even entered the sanctuary, well, that's going to help us break the first dungeon of the game Eastern Palace once we reach it, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The second effect of reaching Death Mountain early comes when Link regains consciousness after first meeting Yuga. Now the cutscene is supposed to look like this, Link is on his bed and then Ravio pops into frame. But because of the sequence breaking, the game skipped ahead in time and has already loaded Ravio's shop into Link's house. Oh, and also, there are two Ravios, a cutscene model and the shop model. Hence why the other Ravio is kinda stoic. You need me to get somebody? Are you okay? Funniest thing is, Ravio still asks if it's okay for him to stay at your house for a while. Well, looks like you've already made yourself at home, so this is awkward. I mean, you even brought another you. And if you continue to play the game and save, this is what Ravio's shop will look like the entire way through, with these two clowns. Other side effects of reaching Death Mountain early is that you also skip a cutscene with Sahasrala, which in turn has a similar glitch as the two Ravios. When you visit Sahasrala, Sahasrala's house normally, there's this cutscene where he mumbles in his sleep about the Master Sword. But if you reach Death Mountain early, the game already has this cutscene stored, but also a later cutscene queued so the game will actually softlock. Whoops! If you avoid visiting Hyrule Castle until you've been through Eastern Palace, House of Gales, and the Tower of Hera, when you eventually make it inside Hyrule Castle, you'll find that two events are actually happening at the same time. You're supposed to visit Hyrule Castle after the Sanctuary to see Zelda. However, Reaching Death Mountain early kinda skipped that. Plus, we've already beaten three dungeons, and as far as the game's concerned, we have all three pendants. This means when you now visit the castle, it's full of soldiers. Not that Impa cares about that, she'll just stand inside one of them. Once inside, this soldier's floating briefly, you know, cause that's normal. And then Zelda, or rather this soldier possessed by Zelda, a la Spirit Tracks, presents Link with a pendant we already have. I hope none of this is canon. The final effect of reaching Death Mountain early is that you skip ever getting the energy gauge in the bottom left corner of the screen by renting the bow after dying at Death Mountain and appearing in Ravio's shop. While this can now make it difficult to tell how much energy you have while using items, it doesn't affect anything else. Okay, before we talk about all the upcoming skips, let's talk about some of the oversights and tech used in speedruns of A Link Between Worlds. First off is a technique known as dash sliding, which is an oversight the developers didn't intend. 
For this, you'll need the Pegasus boots, and during a dash, if you push the circle pad in the opposite direction, Link will begin this sliding animation before coming to a stop. If Link falls during the slide, he'll keep the momentum he had from the dash for the duration of the fall, which in turn allows Link to cross short gaps. All you have to do is time the change of direction correctly before Link actually falls. Dash sliding is used several times in a speedrun, so here are a few of the best examples. It creates a shortcut on the way up to Death Mountain by sliding over this gap. It can be used to grab a small key in the Swamp Palace by making it over to this platform on the left, although this is a very precise dash slide. Dash sliding can also be used to skip a mini boss in Swamp Palace, and also you can use it to reach the boss key early in this same dungeon. Dash sliding may be a small oversight, but its uses are varied. Another technique used in speedruns is a damage boost technique known as bomb boosting. And this is used to break the game in many ways, usually involving reaching ledges that Link is supposed to be unable to. The first example of a bomb boost can be seen when you go to Zora's waterfall to get the Zora flippers from Queen Orin. Standing between this pillar and the wall, drop a bomb and then switch to the tornado rod. You then need to time using the tornado rod just before the bomb explodes. This is pretty precise, but you'll eventually get a feel for it. If you manage to pull the bomb boost off, you should now be placed on the higher ledge, which means you can skip a short cutscene here by avoiding this area entirely. Once you throw the smooth gem in the pool and receive the flippers from Queen Orin, if you step back into this area, you'll trigger the cutscene you skipped, but it'll be glitched out because Queen Queen Orin has already been transformed. Whoa, watch that fishy fly. Bomb boosting can also be used in other parts of the game, but we'll get to that later. Eastern Palace has a fairly simple skip which speeds up this dungeon significantly. It involves using an Armos and the Tornado Rod during invincibility frames after taking damage. Now normally you wouldn't have the Tornado Rod while playing through this dungeon, but because we did the rental items early sequence break, we're able to use it in Eastern Palace. In the room before the boss, activate the moving platform by firing an arrow from here and then head over to the Armos nearest the platform. Use Link's sword to knock the Armos onto the platform and then stand in front of this door. Now make sure you have the Tornado Rod equipped and then you'll need to take damage from the Armos. Now run into the corner like this and time pressing Y to use the Tornado Rod while the Armos is jumping. This will help Link to gain some extra height to end up on top of this wall which is completely, totally not intended. It may take some practice to get this down, but it's not too difficult once you understand when to do what. Once on top of the wall, you'll be out of bounds, and now you can just run around to the other side of the boss door where a loading zone extends upwards enough for you to enter. Well, that was convenient. Doing this skips getting the big key and saves a bunch of time in the Eastern Palace dungeon. The exact same trick can be used in Hyrule Castle later on in a room full of Armos. Just lure them into this corner, take damage, and then time the tornado rod while they're jumping. You get some extra height, now you're out of bounds, and everybody's happy. You can now run along the bottom edge of the screen and then head down once you reach the third pillar, and you'll find that you can now drop outside, skipping the next room. Boy, I'll tell ya, how handy is it they didn't put any collision on top of those walls? A really simple skip can be pulled off in the House of Gales, which uses damage boosting in a similar way to the skip in the Tower of Hera. All that's required is this key perched on a platform above Link. With the Tornado Rod equipped, stand underneath the platform in the center and then use it, which will make the keys perch in the perfect spot at the corner. Killing any other enemies if necessary, now we need to stand slightly to the left, just underneath the keys, and then use the Tornado Rod again. That's it. This will boost Link up to the third floor and skips the rest of the dungeon. Let's go back to bomb boosting for a second and check out a really cool skip in the Tower of Hera. Once you grab this key, in the same room, we can use bomb boosting to push Link up into the ceiling above and skip a fair chunk of this dungeon. In order to do this, we need to stand next to the switch that controls the red and blue elevating walls. Facing away from the switch, we need to drop a bomb on the red wall while it's in the ground. Now quickly turn to face the switch and raise the wall with Link's sword and immediately change to the tornado rod in your items. As the bomb is about to explode, press Y to use the tornado rod, and if you timed it correctly, Link should now be on the floor above and sticking out of this wall. If you now use the tornado rod once again, you'll arrive at the fifth floor. Next, we need to get Link to stand by this wall while we wait for the energy bar to fill up. If you skipped getting it like I did, a visual cue would be 16 or 17 heartbeats in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Once Link's energy is full again, simply use the tornado 
rod two more times to reach this hammer spring on the sixth floor. Now you can continue through the tower as normal to get the boss key and beat Moldor. The hardest part of this skip is the timing on the bomb boost, and once you get a feel for it, the rest is easy. Before reaching the Dark Palace, you'll have to make your way through the Dark Maze guarded by patrols of enemies. Fortunately, there's a big time-saving skip here too. Using this Snapdragon, we can knock Link slightly out of bounds and go almost directly to the end of the maze. To do this, we need to lure the Snapdragon as close to this tree as possible. We can then knock it into the corner with either our sword, or if you have it, the Sand Rod, and here's where things get fun. Equip the Hookshot, stand on the left side of the Snapdragon, and then use the Hookshot to stun it. When it wakes up, up, take damage and then hookshot the snapdragon once again to stun it long enough to dash into the tree which should knock Link out of bounds. The tornado rod method uses the same steps and you stun the snapdragon with a tornado rod then dash into the tree. Once out of bounds, simply run along this edge making sure to avoid the guard blocking this section off. And if you pull that off you can guide Link to Dark Palace skipping the majority of the dark maze. Just call me Glitchy Solid Snake. The next couple of skips are going to use a technique called Quick Equip cancelling. Quick Equip being something that Ravio gives you to help item management later in the game. Quick Equip cancelling basically cancels the end animation an item has after using it, which enables Link to move much sooner than intended, which can open up a whole world of broken dungeons. After pressing Y to use an item, immediately touch the Quick Equip icon in the bottom right corner of the lower screen, and you'll see that Link doesn't wait for the animation of that item to finish. With that in mind, let's check out some of its uses. This next skip uses the previously mentioned Quick Equip cancelling and also another glitch known as Animation Storage. Animation Storage is a developer oversight and can be seen anytime Link just barely touches the small dock platforms that usually have a ladder to reach higher ground. This slight touch tricks the game into thinking Link has jumped out of the water and onto the platform, but in reality, he's still swimming. Now, whenever Link touches the rock walls surrounding a body of water, he'll do the jumping animation and this can help Link to reach some otherwise inaccessible platforms. Forms. The game will lose the storage of this animation if Link dives, swims fast, or is hurt by an enemy. The skip where we'll be using animation storage is called Turtle Skip or Turtle Rock Early and goes like so. Firstly, we'll be using the Quick Equip Cancel to get Link onto a high wall that we can use to skip going to Lake Hylia and using the portals to reach Turtle Rock, which is quicker for a speedrun. Stand on this spot here and press Y to charge up the Fire Rod and press Y again followed immediately by the Quick Equip icon. You have to move quickly down and then down left to jump from the ledge into the fire pillar produced by the fire rod. If done correctly, Link should now be standing on the wall and from here you can make your way around to Turtle Rock and jump into the water below. It's now just a case of swimming to the small dock to the west of here and then swimming up against it to get animation storage. You then need to carefully avoid taking damage from any enemies and swim to this metal platform leading to Turtle Rock. Swim directly underneath it and Link should jump onto the rocky part and if you now use the tornado rod, Link will be placed on the platform and you can enter Turtle Rock easily. This skips having to save any turtles, which obviously saves a ton of time in a run. Now inside Turtle Rock, we can make use of a huge skip, one of the largest in the game, and it's not too difficult to pull off, it just requires some small setup. Firstly, make your way down to the B1 floor of Turtle Rock and then to the main B1 room. In this room, you'll need the ice rod to keep the first seesaw type platform in place to reach the second further south. To set up the skip, we'll need this fire whiz robe that shoots fireballs towards Link. Standing on the second seesaw type platform, the whiz robe will be in the top left corner of the screen and a few seconds later it'll disappear. As soon as it begins to fade away, use the ice rod on the seesaw platform. Then stand here close to the edge of it and press up on the d-pad and wait for the whiz robe to reappear and shoot a fireball towards Link. When you see it start to shoot a fireball, quickly run and use the ice rod exactly how you see here and then switch to using the tornado rod. I'd recommend not using Quick Equip if you're new at this, as actually going into your items will stop everything, giving you the time to react to the next step. Now quickly run to the right and stand under this part of the platform above, and just as the fireball approaches, press Y to use the tornado rod. If timed correctly, Link should now be damage boosted onto the platform above and can proceed to the boss of the dungeon without needing the big key or having done anything else. The great thing about this skip is that if you fail it, you can easily retry it until you really don't have that much health left. And while the timing on things is pretty tight, it gets easier with practice. Swamp Palace is one of the most broken dungeons in the game, thanks to a glitch known as Ice Rod Clipping, which also 
also uses the Quick Equip cancelling. Basically, any time you use the Ice Rod, you're able to Quick Equip cancel out of the Ice Drop animation and move underneath where the ice falls. If you do this by a wall, holding the circle pad in the direction of the wall you want to clip through, you can get the ice to force link through the wall as it falls. To get the idea across, let's put it into practice with the Swamp Palace being a prime example of its use. When you first enter this dungeon, if you merge into the wall and make your way around to this torch, you can actually stand on it and then use Link's sword to put out the flame. Now, if you equip the ice rod and stand facing left like this, use the ice rod and hold the block of ice over the pool of water close to the edge of the torch. Release the Y button and immediately tap the quick equip icon whilst holding left on the circle pad. You then follow this by holding up with the correct timing to successfully clip through the wall and land in the loading zone. It may also help to mash the B button to make it underneath the ice block in time. If you successfully make it into the load zone for the next room, this skips using the big bomb on the rock outside to drain the water and enter the dungeon. The second ice rod clip is much the same as the first, so to save time, here's what it looks like and the controls used to pull it off. Positioning is important and timing is everything, but with practice you should end up out of bounds and able to swim to the next room. In this room, you'll need to raise the water level in order to make it through the rest of the skip. And then we'll do the third and final ice rod clip for this dungeon, and it's pulled off in almost exactly the same way as the other two. The only thing that changes is the direction of the wall you're trying to clip through. This will get us out of bounds yet again, and this time we need to swim north and around the load zone for the stairs, but not too far north as that's a huge drop into a void. Swim around to this point here, and Link will climb onto a platform, and this is the reason we raised the water level. Level. From here we can use the tornado rod to get Link on top of the walls of the dungeon and now we head left to transition the screen to the boss room. Now you can fight the boss by dropping into this room but we're gonna skip it. Tap up on the circle pad and you'll see the room change and then the camera will catch up with Link. We now need to carefully and precisely line Link up so that we can fast swim directly downwards for the next step. You can use these dots on the wall as a guideline, and if Link looks exactly like this, you're good to go. Press B, and Link should now be standing inside the wall on the very edge of a thin seam. Okay, make very small movements up left and then face right so Link is in a decent position, as we next need to press and hold B to charge a spin attack. Still holding B, carefully head left as straight as you can until Link won't go any further. Now, if you move up left, Link will enter the load zone for the staircase leading to the painting and skip the boss fight and finish Swamp Palace dungeon super quick. It goes without saying that this is probably one of the hardest skips in the game, so it's going to take a lot of practice. Phew. If you thought that was impressive, Desert Palace Skip is probably one of my favourite skips in the entire game, purely based on the fact that you never actually enter Desert Palace Dungeon, it's that much of a skip. It starts off by using the Ice Rod Clipping technique we saw in the Swamp Palace which takes place on the corner of this wall. Use the Ice Rod to place a block of ice here, press the Quick Equip button on the lower screen and then run left followed by a very brief up on the circle pad. If you hold up too long, Link will fall through the ground which isn't really ideal. A successful clip should now have Link inside this wall and to get out you need to equip the tornado rod and then use it, which places Link on the higher ledge and that's stage 1 of the skip. Stage 2 is to head south to this point and then equip the fire rod. Stand exactly here and then press and hold Y to charge the tornado rod and then press Y again followed immediately by the quick equip icon on the lower screen. You then have to run diagonally down and to the right so that Link jumps off the open ledge and then gets damage boosted up onto the outer wall above. It takes practice but this is the easiest method method of reaching this point, and that's step 2. Step 3 is to just dash around the edge of the map to reach this part of Desert Palace and then drop onto this stone ledge. Now line Link up exactly like this and we're going to perform a dash slide to complete the skip. Stand here facing right, hold the L button to charge the dash, and almost as soon as Link begins moving and reaches this point, press the circle pad left in the opposite direction. If you're successful, Link will drop into the sand and land where the heart container and Irene portrait are, so now just grab the heart and touch the portrait and that's Desert Palace skipped. Another example of fire rod boosting can be seen on Snowy Death Mountain in Lowrule. The bridge that crosses over to the ice cave is damaged and usually you'd have to visit Rosso's ore mine in Hyrule in order to access the ice cave. However, using pretty much the same method as Desert Palace skip, we can cross it relatively easily. Stand Link on the fifth plank from the edge and then use the fire rod, immediately pressing the quick equip icon on the lower screen. You then have to run upright and then downright in order for Link to get knocked back and placed on top 
top of the wooden post of the bridge. Now equip the hookshot and carefully move left, aiming the hookshot diagonally as you see here. Now standing on the sixth plank from the edge, fire the hookshot and Link will be pulled through the ropes on the opposite side of the bridge and now you'll be able to run directly right and hookshot the post on the other side no problem. For speed's sake, keep running on top of this wall and you'll be able to avoid a trigger for Hilda's text by reaching this lower area, and save a few seconds. The Ice Ruins Palace is a whole new realm of broken Zelda dungeons, and it's amazing how simple it is to beat with practice. The first thing to contend with in this dungeon is getting out of bounds, and it's finicky, but once you know what you're doing, it's easy enough. What we need to do is stand on these blue blocks that rise and fall through the floors, more specifically the one that rises. Standing close to the edge, we need to time a move to the right so that Link is pushed up into the floor in an odd way. Best way I found to do this is to get close enough and then wait till the edge of the block is completely covering the blue tiles on the floor like this. You can easily retry it if you fail as there's no penalty, but once you get an idea of the timing, you should get something like this where Link is half in the wall, half on the block. Here you need to immediately press up on the circle pad and then press L long enough to use the Pegasus boots. If you do this quickly enough and bear in mind it's a very tight window, you'll end up with Link completely out of bounds. Now the next part of the huge ice ruin skip is all about guiding Link to the boss by reaching a couple of important points. Firstly, you'll want to stand here above the corner of these blue tiles facing right. Then slowly and carefully take tiny steps until Link drops down to the lower floor. Now repeat that step again, but this time in the corner of this light blue tiled section, making tiny steps diagonally up and right. When you see the screen transition, don't touch anything and just let Link fall down towards the boss. It's incredibly easy to fail if you move to the right too much. If you're successful, stay in the upper sections of this arena and the boss Darkstair won't spawn, but for some reason, you can still kill it by using the fire rod twice at the hole in the center. This will trigger the heart container to spawn and also the painting to finish the dungeon. Some might say that's a pretty cool skip. No? Uh, <clears throat> In Skull Woods is a small oversight that can be exploited when you reach this room with the eyeball that you hookshot and then place in the pedestal. Once the eyeball is thrown, there's a small window of time where Link is able to pick the eyeball up once again. When the eyeball is picked up, the last position it had on the ground is stored as an invisible object with no collision and is normally impossible to interact with. However, when it's thrown into the pedestal, it's possible to interact with the invisible object during the animation where it rests on the pedestal, meaning Link can pick it up once again. And so you're able to skip the lower portion of this room to retrieve the second eyeball that needs to be placed in the other pedestal simply by carrying over the original. But if you throw the eyeball on the ground after the regrab, the eyeball will lose its solid state and Link won't be able to interact with it anymore. However, he will be able to hookshot it, which isn't really much help. This next glitch is very useful and kind of hilarious when you think about it. There's a way to skip the Knuckle Master boss in Skullwood's dungeon that's so easy it was actually discovered on the day of release. To do this, you'll need the Tornado Rod equipped and stand roughly here or preferably more in the center. Knuckle Master will charge an attack and then leave the screen, which is when you need to use the Tornado Rod. And if you've timed this correctly, you should hear Link go up the staircase loading zone behind the wall. What's happened is that Knuckle Master is actually pushing Link into the loading zone and therefore helps you skip the boss entirely. If you're a completionist and worried about the heart container you'd receive after this fight, don't worry. You can always return and fight Knuckle Master properly to earn it if you've ever wanted to try this glitch out. There's a really simple skip in Thieves Hideout that requires a lot of pushing statues around, but it's worth it in the long run. In the very first room you enter to the left are two statues that you need to push into place to unlock the north room. Once you've done what's intended, now move the statues across the room so you end up with this situation where both statues are next to each other, with the one on the left sitting on top of the bars that draw up when the switch is active. If you now place a bomb next to the switch and then have Link stand and grab the statue on the right, when the bars rise they'll push the left statue over the right and then push Link into the floor. It's important to note that you need to grab the statue from the top and not the lower part, as this will push Link down into B2, and that's not what we're we're trying to do. So it's best to stand just above the statue and then grab it for the correct positioning. This will push Link into the floor and from here we just need to hold up on the circle pad. The camera will now constantly switch back and forth 
forth as Link is technically between two floors, and the game doesn't know how to handle this. Eventually, you'll reach another room where Link is standing on top of the wall, and from here we can drop a bomb to activate the switch for this room. Now head right and then up until Link is standing at the corner of this wall facing an up and right direction. If we now simply press L to charge the Pegasus boots and dash, Link will arrive in this room leading into a mini boss and thus skipping a small chunk of Thieves hideout. In regards to Thieves' Hideout, with all the sequence breaks in the game and the ability to skip Desert Palace completely, this enables you to complete Thieves' Hideout last, which it seems the developers intended to be one of the first low rule dungeons you visit and where you receive the Sand Rod. However, completing Thieves' Hideout as the final dungeon before going to Low Rule Castle has an interesting effect. When you receive the final painting after Thieves' Hideout, you're taken into this cutscene, which is expected, but what's happening is the game is now playing two cutscenes at the same time. One is the scene where you rescue the first sage Osvala and he gives you the sand rod, and the second overlapping cutscene is what you'd see when all the low rule dungeons are complete with all the sages rescued, and Link receives the Triforce of Courage. Except the game is actually a bit confused as to which scene is happening, which means there are some invisible steps up to the Triforce, but it's not actually there and so Link is unable to grab it. This whole thing is pretty comical to experience, but doing the dungeons in this order with Thieves' Hideout last actually has a real use in a speedrun. The cutscene where you save all the sages and get the Triforce is over a minute long, but having the Osphala Sandrod cutscene playing at the same time means you skip and save that time. And stepping into the blue warp to end the cutscene still gives Link the Triforce of Power to enter Low Rule Castle anyway, so it's win-win. Our final major skip happens in Low Rule Castle and skips all the mini bosses and takes you straight to Yuga Ganon as quick as a flash. To perform this skip, firstly you need to reach this room with multiple red and blue switches and make your way to the huge boulder with the giant blue bomb next to it. Stand on the lowered red wall and carefully fire off an arrow to the right between the boulder and the bomb, making sure not to trigger the bomb which would destroy the boulder. And we need it to help us pull off the skip. Hitting the switch with an arrow will raise the red wall while Link is standing on it. And now we can complete the setup of the skip. We next need to have Link standing on the very edge of this wall on the second square tile, and then charge up Link's sword for a spin attack. If Link does this small jump when you release the spin attack, you'll be in the perfect spot. The next step should feel pretty familiar as now we'll be using another damage boost to get out of bounds. We need to drop a bomb in front of Link, then charge up the spin attack, and just as the bomb is about to explode, release the spin attack. As Link does the small jump, the bomb explodes while Link is in the air and this knocks him backwards onto the top of the wall. You can now simply run across the top of this wall and then exit this screen down and to the right, which drops Link nicely behind the door to the final area of the game and onto the fight with Yuga Ganon. As with many of the damage boosts in the game, it's all about timing. Once you've got that down, Low Roll Castle is a cinch. Wow, that was an awful lot of skipping things, and that wraps up A Link Between Worlds with some pretty sweet glitches you can try out for yourselves. I am officially spent. And if you like this episode, why not check out the rest of the series featuring a ton of Zelda games? You can click that playlist there for more glitchy goodness. You can follow the show on Twitter or any of the other social media to keep up to date on all things Son of a Glitch. And as always, a huge thanks to everybody who supports the show on Patreon. See ya!